everybody. Good evening. Welcome to the second Theologian in Residence program event of the year. We are very pleased to have Dr. Robert Ludwig from Loyola University of Chicago here with us this evening. I have a few remarks that I would like to make briefly at the beginning, and then I'll turn it over to Joe Kim, who will introduce Dr. Ludwig. Um, <clears throat> we're in a little bit of a transition in, at TIR these days, um, uh, and I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the terrific service of somebody who has done an enormous amount for TIR over the last five or six years. Um, you guys all see the speakers, sometimes you see me making announcements, um, but there's somebody who works behind the scenes whose importance to the program far exceeds her visibility. And so I would like to say um, thank you to Maria Eisman, who <laughs> Maria has been with the program as a board member and as our only staff person um, since 2008 or 7. Okay, but it's been a while. Um, and she has uh, been working with a number of nonprofits, including us, over the last few years and has recently taken on um, an increased role with the Colorado Clean Cities Coalition. Um, and she will be phasing out as a TIR staff person. She'll be remaining on the board for now, but she'll be phasing out as a staff person. Um, but I wanted to uh, uh, take this opportunity to thank her for her service. And I'm also pleased to announce that we have a new person who will be returning to the board um, to take over and expand many of those um, services that Maria has um, provided. Um, Denise Mayer, are you here, Denise? Yes. Denise, um, uh, I wanted to welcome her, but really it's a welcome back. She was the board president for three years of the Theologian in Residence program, and also, like Maria, has given much service to the program over the years. And um, she comes to us with a good theological background, um, a lively uh, spiritual life and um, relationships with many of you, and she'll, we think she'll be a real asset to the program. Um, so thank you to Maria, and welcome back to Denise. A couple quick other things. I want to say thank you um, to all of our sponsors who have um, made financial contributions to make this program and all of the programs this fall uh, possible many of you are here in this room and we are very grateful. We are a 100% donor uh, funded organization and so all of you who are here tonight, um, your entrance fees, um, suggested donations, and those of you who have made additional contributions, we are extremely grateful. Thank you very much. Um, thank you also to First United Methodist Church. Um, we're honored to have Reverend Steve Easter David Patton with us. Um, today, First United uh, Methodist has really adopted the TIR program in letting us use space um, and uh, providing the, the goodies in the back, and we're just really grateful um, to, have, uh, to have this new partnership. So thank you, Steve. And finally, if you didn't notice it on the way in, there is a book display that uh, David Reed of the um, Northern Colorado Faith Library here um, put together that parallels a lot of the um, themes and authors that we'll be um, uh, meeting uh, during this uh, during this year's program. And so I encourage you to check out that book display on the way out, and also to consider um, signing up for a library card, library card, becoming a, a member of this really fabulous, this first-rate um, church library here. And um, now I would like to turn it over to Jim Reed, who has two announcements, and I promise we will get to the program. <laughs> yeah, these are just very brief. First of all, um, I had this idea that kind of evolved over the last maybe six or eight months about a lot of us are sort of dispersed from John 23rd, and we have profound relationships that started there. And I keep hearing from people, I just miss not seeing the people that I met there. And so... Uh, 
Mary Balza and a couple other of her friends and I have gotten together and we've planned a couple of reunions for people who just want to get together, basically. It's just an evening. It'll be very simple. It'll be a potluck, uh, a time to settle so formal sharing, and then a time of prayer. And that is very, going to be very, very simple. And it's going to be very positive, yes, is the other thing <laughs> I want to say clearly, too. And that's uh, going to be at uh, the Trinity Lutheran community has uh, allowed us to gonna meet there on the 24th of uh, October at 6 o'clock from like 6 to maybe 7.30. So it'll be a short evening, just a chance to reconnect and continue the, the giving of the relationships that began maybe at John 23rd. And, and uh, we just don't run into each other the way we used to. So it's a nice opportunity to do that. Uh, the second thing, quickly, is uh, many of you know Maria and Jim Cox. They would be here tonight if, if they weren't in the hospital at the uh, University Hospital in Denver. Because Jim Cox had pancreatic uh, cancer surgery yesterday morning. And uh, I just talked to Maria about 5 o'clock this afternoon. He's doing extremely well. Uh, this is actually one of those pancreatic cancer uh, cancers that is very treatable, actually. And so the prognosis is very good. They've got first-class surgeons. And, and he'll be there for about seven days and then come home and... But uh, I would like to just maybe take one moment, because this is a very powerful prayer group, to just have you focus on his healing and support for his family, too. Could you do that with me? Amen. Thank you. Sort of the, one of the interesting things is that Jim and Maria Cox met at Loyola, which is where Bob Ludwig works. She was on the staff there as a campus minister years ago. That's where they met. So they would have loved to have been here and met you too, Bob. So I'm going to turn it over to Joe and go ahead and introduce you. Good evening. Uh, thank all of you. Uh, I'd like to thank Denise. She was also the assistant to the director for about 10 or 12 years when I was the director of the program, so she knows the history of this program. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all. Uh, Jim asked me to do a little preamble, but we're so late, and I, maybe I don't need to. We, we realized uh, that the context of this series this year is the complexity of our experience and the diversity of our experience. And we wanted to give you a framework for dealing with all that complexity. And uh, we decided to talk about a philosopher, Ken Wilber. And some of you really got a lot of it. And some of you said, I just left with my head spinning. <laughs> and we knew that was going to happen. Uh, but I get a chance to do another introduction. And we, have, we learned a lot from your feedback and from doing it. So that topic is going to come up again when I get to speak uh, October 29th. So uh, we hope you'll stay with us. And I promise it will be uh, much clearer. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we're talking about philosophers and sociologists. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce a theologian who will be speaking about the spirituality of another theologian. And I presume some of you are here because you've heard of Richard Rohr. And uh, I hope some of you have heard of Bob Ludwig. Bob Ludwig was the theologian in residence in Boulder when I uh, became available, having resigned from the priesthood and teaching at the seminary in Denver, 1974. And they decided to split Bob's job in between Boulder and Fort Collins and Greeley. Uh, he was on the search committee which hired me. And in fact, the first time I found my way to Fort Collins, I had instructions from Bob to take the prospect exit and go west on prospect until I hit Shields and then go north to John 23rd. I just sort of remember that. <laughs> Bob is the one who gave me the vision of what the Theologian in Residence <coughs> program wanted to be, because he knew the founder a very charismatic Benedictine priest, Father Forsyth, in Boulder, who wanted church ministry to relate to the intellectual life of Catholics and to relate to the university. He let the church's ministry 
should be to the intellectual life as well as every other life, and that should include the university. So I got that mission from Bob, and he was like a mentor. He taught me so many things. So many books that were really important in my career were recommended to me by Bob. And I guess uh, all I can say is that our conversation and friendship over those decades, uh, it's, uh, it's very much like the relationship that Jim Reed and I have had. So those are really rich, powerful relationships. Bob has a great sense of humor. You'll see from a paper introduction, he's been teaching theology, he's been writing books, he's been the administrator of the Institute for Ministry at Loyola in New Orleans, uh, and in Chicago, and in a few other places. But he hasn't moved that much. But he's been teaching and writing and administrating all those years. He has a great sense of humor. He has a great knowledge of the church in the United States because of his position. He was the director of these extension programs. So he's known Catholic lay students of theology from all over the country. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Robert Luthi. Is it, uh, where's the IT guy? Is it okay if I use this and, and not this? Is that okay? I don't have to stick that thing in my ear. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Very kind words, and it's all mutual. Um, very much so. And uh, many thanks to the Theologian Residence Program for bringing us back here to Colorado. My wife, Kathleen, is with me tonight. Um, we still miss Colorado, and uh, it's great to be back among you tonight. And they have such a great uh, crowd. So, um, fundamentally, I'm a teacher. Uh, I'm, uh, and, and as a teacher, I lecture interactively. So I'm hoping that tonight will not just be a, a one-way, is this on still? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not just a one way, but that we can have plenty of room for uh, discussion, questions, uh, people uh, adding their own comments. When Joe and, and Jim Reed first contacted me about coming out here and being a part of this uh, fall event, um, I immediately thought of Richard Rohr and said, you know, that would be, that was, that's like what I would like to focus on. Um, how many of you are familiar with Richard Rohr? Oh, well, see, Joe, that's why there's such a big crowd. <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with you or me. <laughs> but see, that's amazing. Because I think Richard Rohr is probably the most influential uh, Catholic spokesperson uh, in terms of theology and, and spirituality in the country today, without a doubt. Um, and there's a reason for that. Uh, the reason for that is, is because he is connecting with people's lived experience, and he's speaking to, uh, to that experience. So he's widely known, he's influential, and uh, you may or may not know that he has now stopped traveling. So as soon as he told me that he had stopped traveling, I said, well, I'm going to start traveling. <laughs> I'm talking about Richard Rohr. Uh, he's, he's founded this living school at his center in Albuquerque. Uh, and it's a two-year program that people engage uh, primarily uh, over the internet, but they do spend uh, some periods of time down there in Albuquerque at the center. And uh, it's a very exciting and ambitious program. And, uh, so he told me, he said, I said, well, how many people? He said, well, we've, we've narrowed it down. I, I forget what he told me. I think they have 6,000 people starting this program this fall. And uh, next fall, they'll start another cohort. So that there'll be 12,000 in this program. And that's turning away another 8,000. That's amazing to me. And it says uh, something about what he's been all about, and, and of course what our focus will be tonight. Um, so Richard Rohr, a Franciscan priest, 
uh, founder of the Center for Contemplation and Action in Albuquerque, prior to that in Cincinnati with the New Jerusalem community, uh, a prolific author, uh, published, I don't know, uh, probably close to 20 books, maybe more, and has done a lot of uh, media uh, presentations as well that are available through CDs or CD, uh, uh, DV, I never get that right, <laughs> DVRs and, and CD-ROMs. Um, so where did Roar come from? Well, it came from Kansas, but What's interesting about Richard Rohr is that, uh, like Joachim and myself, and probably many of you in the room today, we're all children of the Second Vatican Council. Uh, we were influenced profoundly by what happened uh, in, in the, the Roman Catholic Church uh, between 1962 and 1965, uh, and what came after that. And uh, we're equally inspired by our wonderful Pope Francis uh, as he emerges onto the scene in recent months and is saying much of the same things that we've been saying for decades. Thank God. Um, so Rohr is, is, is a, 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 a great uh, product of Vatican II and he's also someone who probably because of Vatican II became very grounded in the scriptures. You know, I teach the history of Christian thought, and um, I, I like to say that uh, around the year 1000, uh, we gave the Holy Spirit to Eastern Catholicism, and in 1500, we gave the Bible to the Protestants. <laughs> so all we were left with was, was the papacy. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, but I think Vatican II was an attempt, honestly, to retrieve real connections with the Holy Spirit and with Scripture. And I think this is all reflected beautifully in what Rohr has been writing and teaching about. So he's grounded in the Scriptures, and we're going to talk about that tonight. Um, he also recognizes how what we're now learning about human experience of God, our spiritual experience, as we, as we begin to study the, the, uh, the soul and the experience of the soul in the contemporary world, we're seeing that this connects with everything else, with, with uh, contemporary developments in psychology, obviously, but certainly also with contemporary, with, with what we call the new physics, with neurosciences, uh, all of the, all of the uh, important breakthroughs that are going on in the world of science and the humanities today are connected to what we're talking about and what Rohr, and Rohr is very interested in all of this as well and brings it into his, his teaching. Okay, so, what, what is Rohr basically saying? He's saying that, I think he's saying that Christianity is at root and essentially a mysticism. A mysticism that somewhere along the line has lost its way um, and has become instead what he calls churchianity. Uh, and, and we have lost uh, we have lost our, our experience, our inner experience. We've become a belonging system and a believing system. So people uh, believe certain things uh, and they belong. Um, and uh, the deeper experience may or may not be there. That's what we crave, that's what we need. That's what our soul is made for. Uh, as Augustine said so many years ago, our hearts are made for you, and they are restless until they rest in you. So that connection with God, and all the spirit substitutes, and all the escapisms that are all around us today uh, are there in part because 
uh, we're neglecting this. And we're not connecting with this. So Christianity is essentially a, a mysticism. Obviously, it's not the only mysticism. But it's a good mysticism. And its mysticism is grounded in the Bible. All the authors, I, I, I'm a theologian, I was trained in systematic theology, and then beginning in Boulder in 1972 when Bob Lester said, well, how would you like to teach this course called Jesus in the New Testament? I said, oh, I'd love to. I thought, I'm going to teach the New Testament. Uh, I've been teaching scripture for 40 years. And I think all of the biblical authors are mystics. And I think what they're writing about is mystical experience. And I think what biblical scholarship is going to tell people today, is telling people today, is that this whole business of thinking that we're dealing with history is crazy. This is not a factual document at all. But it is a document that speaks to the, to the mystical experience, the mystical faith experience, the revelation of faith experience that was a part of the, the people of Israel and then the, the community of, of Jews and Gentiles that emerged in the first century known as the church. So tonight I'm going to talk about Jesus as a, as a Jewish mystic. And Paul as what we call a Jesus, a Jewish Christ mystic. Uh, and uh, about the Greek fathers and the teachings that emerged in those first centuries around the incarnation and the Trinity as primarily being essentially mystical. We can't understand those doctrines. Uh, well, of course, you can't understand anything mystical. But I mean, you can't engage those doctrines outside of a, a, a mystical consciousness. Uh, and, and uh, you know, for years, uh, people like me who go to Catholic schools growing up, we tried to, tried to figure out what the Trinity was without any idea of the inner experience of God. But tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about that. And we're going to talk about how we got derailed what is called the, the emergence of the, the Roman, uh, the Latin, excuse me, the Latin Catholic paradigm, what Hans Kuhn calls the emergence of the Latin Catholic paradigm, and primarily uh, in the, in the uh, teaching of, of uh, Augustine of Hippo, St. Augustine, who ironically was himself a marvelous mystic, but who got into oppositional thinking with Pelagius and uh, with the Donatists in North Africa and eventually uh, created a theology that I think uh, really derailed us in so many profound ways. Um, we have to get over original sin. Uh, <laughs> who was it? Jack Shea said, well, what we did was we created a disease in order to offer a cure. Um, but uh, the antidote to Augustine uh, is prior in the scriptures and in the Greek fathers, but later it comes particularly in the wonderful figure of Francis of Assisi. That's where our Pope is today in Assisi, celebrating the memory of Francis. Um, and so, so he's, he's uh, a, a very important figure. A lot of people say, well, Christianity would have been lost to the West had it not been for Francis. Um, and the theological tradition that emerged from him, particularly tonight I want to talk about the figure of Duns Scotus, very important, because here, instead of talking about original sin, we talk about original grace. And what Rohr persistently has called radical grace. That's the title of these two lectures tonight and, and Monday night, Radical Grace. So from, from uh, Francis and Duns Scotus, 
there comes a new consciousness that says the world is shot through of great with grace, and we need to open our our eyes and our soul to it. Um, and of course, Francis was a great mystic. Again, I think his theology feeds the mysticism. So all of that ultimately leads to the need to retrieve contemplative mind and uh, this, this awareness of grace in our time. So with that, I'm going to actually try to use these uh, slides. Um, I don't know, you probably can't even read them, especially far in the back. But basically I say, uh, I quote a roar here where he says, Christianity and religion in general are not helping people and it is frequently exacerbating their suffering. It has become churchianity, a believing and belonging system that socializes people into a pattern of shame and guilt. I remember I had a, a Lutheran woman in my uh, theology class in a Catholic university, and I said, uh, she said, well, I'm not, I'm not Catholic, but I'm sending my daughter to the Catholic school. And I said, well, why are you sending your daughter to the Catholic school? I want her to get the guilt. <laughs> what your childhood was like. I had a lovely childhood growing up in Des Moines, Iowa with my eight brothers and sisters in the pre humane Vitae Catholicism. And, um, but we were all socialized into uh, a, a system, a pattern of shame and guilt. And uh, there was something very scary about the religion that we learned. Um, and it was very difficult to work through that to get on to the other side. But, uh, but you can do it. You can do it. So this, this system and this pattern contributes, Rohr says, because Catholicism is not the only place where people are socialized into a pattern of of, of uh, shame and guilt. This, it contributes to a, a polarized and violent culture that prospers radical individualism, excessive competition, that's characterized by greed, by fear, by hatred, addictions, and vast suffering. Sounds like this morning's paper. <laughs> you know, and, and sadly it does. We're so polarized as a society. We're so either or, yes, no, black, white. Um, and moving beyond that dual consciousness to a broader sense of both and, of complementarity, of paradox, that's the goal of what Rohr is talking about in, in his uh, mystical theology. He says, uh, Basically, we need to see as the mystics see. He uses the image of the third eye. Um, seeing with the third eye, a mystic, he says, is one who has moved from mere belief systems or belonging systems to actual inner experience. And those of us that have, have even a rudimentary knowledge of uh, the world religions and of the primal religions, Native American traditions and so forth, know that all of these traditions agree that such a movement is possible and desirable and available to everyone. One of the problems with mysticism is we always thought that it was only for the incredibly exceptional people. Tonight we're going to talk about an ordinary mysticism. In fact, a kind of mandatory mysticism. Because Rohr thinks that if you live life and you encounter it with a certain level of seriousness and, and honesty, that it, the transformational process uh, towards union with the absolute mystery is, is going to be part of that. So mysticism, far from being exceptional, is, is something that's built into the fabric of our 
of, of our humanity. There is an anthropomorphic base for mysticism, um, and it is something that ought to be universal. Uh, okay, so uh, Vatican II, well, Vatican II wanted to retrieve our lost tradition. <coughs> And a lot of people thought, well, it really just wanted to make the church cool. <laughs> I have some undergraduate students who thought, well, Dr. Ludwig, isn't that, isn't that where, uh, isn't that the place where there was a lot of emphasis on gay rights and, and women being ordained priests? I said, no, those issues were not on the table. Uh, what it was really about was trying it was recognizing that we had lost our way, that somehow we had been derailed, and that we were trying to retrieve something that is fundamental and, and, and basic to who we are, including the Holy Spirit and the scriptures. And the vision of Vatican II moves from a church-centered understanding to a Christ-centered understanding, and then still further to a God-centered understanding. Those are three kind of movements. I would say Christianity, certainly in Catholicism, had become church-centered. You could spend a lot of time in church and not even hear much about Jesus Christ. Um, and even less about God. Um, so, from church-centered to Christ-centered to God-centered, and um, focused increasingly on uh, direct lived experience. Okay? So, the key players in, in the council um, were the, the theologians, uh, much to the dismay of the bishops. <laughs> no, but the, the theologians were truly very important to that council, and they became the teachers of the bishops, and they, they, they did most of the authoring and editing of, of the text that the bishops passed. You know, Pope Benedict, uh, at, at the beginning of the 50th anniversary of the council, which many of us were looking forward to as a time to really celebrate something that was really of great historical significance, waved his finger and said, there's too many people that are looking at that council and are, de are describing it and interpreting it in such a way that they're, they see it as a disruptive discontinuity. And I thought, he's talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> he says the council's teachings have been misinterpreted by emphasizing novelty and change. But I would argue that the council itself sought a reconnection with origins, <clears throat> recognizing that historical developments had eroded our focus on what is foundational and central. The radical discontinuity is what the church had become. So the council taught a fundamental continuity with the testimony of scripture and the earliest Christian faith, and they called it adjournamento and resourcement. Okay, so I'm not going to go into these tonight. I decided <coughs> I would share them with you, but these are the, the thematic foci of Rohr's corpus. Experience, tradition, scripture, mutual uh, interpretation, Scripture interpreting our experience, our experience interpreting Scripture, <laughs> using tradition. It's a tripolar, a mutual interpretation, and, and that's the only way it makes any sense. Um, if you don't bring your own experience into dialogue with Scripture, it remains somebody else's story and never our story. The universe isn't out to kill us. It's not out to get us. There's a buoyancy. There's a buoyancy in life. J. 
Jesus is the benevolent face of God, and therefore it is a benevolent universe. Again, a theme, we're not going to explore it totally here, but it's important to recognize. Rohr says there's only one reality, that there's no dualisms and no alternatives. So, you know, we grew up, I grew up in a, in a world of dualisms, flesh and spirit, body and soul, you know, history and eternity, this realm, another realm, so on and so forth. Uh, dualism's everywhere. And we thought of God, we still, I mean, still basically we think about God as, you know, a choice. But do you believe in God? Do you believe in God? We don't realize, as I think Rohr does, that God is an optional. Like the psalmist says, you can run to the farthest ends of the earth and still God will be there. Because God is reality. God is reality. Mysterious, unpredictable, but interactive. Interactive, responsive. The dialogical, relational relationship, uh, interaction of human beings uh, and reality is the love affair that God is having with people. Now, a lot of people don't like the word God. Uh, it's, it's become a, a painful word for them, maybe even. Or it's, it's a word that... Uh, confuses them because they think of a puppeteer. But if you think of God as reality, that's, that's the teaching, you know, above that we find in, in the Hebrew Bible. You know, why is there an exclusive loyalty only to this one God? Because that's reality. There is only one reality. And any attempt to move away from it is its own form of idolatrous, uh, idolatries. Well, again, we can talk about that, but uh, uh, this is great in Rohr's teaching. Emergent Christianity and interfaith understanding, we have a room full tonight of emergent Christianity. Denominationalism is largely over. It's largely over. If it's not over for us, it is for our kids and our grandkids. And so, uh, we're, we're living in, a, in, in an incredibly epical time when something incredible is happening. And what Roar and others are calling the emergent church. And it's grounded in a lot of these things that we're talking about here tonight. <clears throat> Acceptance and transformation. Mm -hmm. A lot of things in reality we need to accept. Um, and uh, the paradoxical reality of people who think differently than us. <laughs> you know? But oppositional thinking is not the way to respond. We'll never be transformed. These two go together. Suffering teaches us transformation, acceptance and transformation. How do, we, how do we become transformed? Well, we become transformed simply from dealing with the adversity that life will deal us, and every life has its adversities. Some very obvious, and to the point where you can say, well, where's the other side of that? There's nothing but adversity. But every life deals with adversity, and we need to learn to accept and transform rather than to try and eliminate. And finally, reality, yeah, it's paradoxical, it's complementarity, and we can't have a, a dual, um, dualistic thinking if we want to get it right. His eight principles are these, the teachings of Jesus, 
Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> the teachings of Jesus. It doesn't take rocket science to look around at a lot of the things that are so controversial today with the New Testament on one hand and say, well, what would Jesus say? It wouldn't be the kind of oppositional uh, uh, literalism that we, we, we see so much of. Contemplative mind, huge. Not oppositional, but transforming our pain. Prophets at the edge. Prophets at the edge. Yeah, I think, you know, we need to look not at the center, but at the edge. That's where you're going to find uh, the voice uh, uh, that is the contemporary voice of the prophets. Prophecy and mysticism go together in this emergent Christianity. One interprets the other. The other leads to the other. Rohr is primarily a mystic who's very interested and involved in social justice and, and uh, uh, peacemaking. Uh, the other hero in my life, Daniel Berrigan, is primarily a peace activist, but he's also a mystic. We had him come and teach in Chicago for a semester, and my student said, is he on drugs? <laughs> <laughs> because he walked around with a kind of blissfulness all the time. Uh, but the importance of, of, of prophecy and the edge. The breadth of truth. Yes. The idea that we have to have oppositional science and, and religion have to be oppositional is ridiculous. Truth is broad, and there are many ways to comprehend and understand it and to seek it. Um, and um, anybody who's seeking the truth uh, is, is seeking the same truth. Uh, there's, only, there's only one truth. We might name it different, and we might use different methodologies and, and approaches. But And then he says, asking the right questions is much more important than always coming up with the right answers. Asking the right questions. Part of the reason we're so hungry for answers is that we're answering, that we're asking the wrong questions. Expanding our mind. And then what we're going to talk about primarily with our focus on Monday night, finding our true self. Finding our true self. Because um, it's not always obvious. And the self we thought we were might have been just what we thought we were and not what we really were. And then finally, living into a new way of thinking. Orthopraxis leads to orthodoxy rather than the other way around. Okay, so what is mysticism? Well, it's basically the experiential knowledge of God. What we know of God from our experience. And that's why we call it ineffable, it, it breaks our language. One of the great contemplative uh, uh, disciplines and practices is silence. Because uh, words already ruin what it is that we're, we're being grasped by. So knowledge of God is our encounter with reality and recognizing that our encounter with reality, and by this I'm talking about our, our human relationships, our families, our attempts to be creative, uh, our workplace existence, our politics, encountering the, the natural world and our existence, all of those things are also a theophany. Um, our encounter with reality are also a theophany whether we use that language or not. And some people will just say, wow, I gotta tell you about this thing. And they will tell you their experience. 
Uh, they're not a religious person. They won't use religious language. We get caught up thinking that the language is what it's all about, and it isn't. It's the experience behind the language, and that's what's so wonderful about silence. Well, I've got a quote here from uh, uh, William James, and then I go in and talk a little bit about Evelyn Underhill, uh, who sees mysticism as a process towards union. And she studied the mystics, and she's kind of a classic author who studied a lot of the mystics and found uh, these basic uh, stages, awakening, purgation, <coughs> illumination, the dark night of the soul and union. And if you, if you read the mystics, many of whom are speaking autobiographically, these are the, these are the path that, that they trod. Um, but Rohr would say, this is life. This is life. This is the adult phase of our life. Conversion, purgation, illumination, the dark night and union. At least that's the invitation that we have in the second half of life. Um, and again, uh, not everybody's going to use that language, but you know, developmental psychologists have been talking about this for a long time too. So we need to uh, we need to talk about the presence of God in the world and in human experience. This is something that was largely eclipsed after the Enlightenment, where the divine became this distant, transcendent reality, uh, decidedly not on the human experience of God. And uh, we, we limited God's, our, our uh, experience of God in the high liturgical tradition to the experience of God that was brokered through the sacraments. Um, so the sacraments became the encounters with God and this is where, where I think the tradition is really the opposite. The sacraments are where we go to celebrate our encounters with God in life. <laughs> so it is, it is life uh, uh, that that is where we are going to encounter God. And in recent decades, then, we, we begin to see an increased focus on this unbrokered human experience of, uh, of God. That becomes the focus of a lot of theology in the late 20th and into the 21st century. And one of the great thinkers was, was Karl Reiner, the German... Uh, Jesuit, um, who, who really developed a, a, a theology that focuses on a kind of everyday mysticism. A lot of people would, would tell you that Reiner's theology grows out of his practice of the Ignatian exercises. So it was his Ignatian spirituality that drove his theology in the direction that it was. Whether that's true or not, uh, I don't know, but I do know that this became his focus. And for, for Reiner, the very essence of the human person, what is at the core of our humanity is what he calls our capacity for God. That is, that our experience of the transcendent, um, whether it's recognized as God or not, uh, is a persistent mystery. Um, that uh, encounters us in all of the ordinary aspects of our humanity. So the, this idea of grace is not created grace, something that is mediated, again, through the sacraments, so much as it is God's own uncreated self donation, God's self-gift to persons, in our drive to our strength, so where do we face God? We face God in our knowing, in our loving, in our hoping, in our creating. That's where our experience encounters this open-ended mystery. We seek, we have a question, we seek an answer. We get an answer, it opens up new questions. 
opens up new answers, new questions. Our process of knowing stretches out towards mystery. Same thing with loving. The more you love someone, in some ways, uh, the less you know them. <laughs> uh, in, in this sense, that you, you, never, you never get there. There's, on the other end of your love is a mystery. Uh, and, and it is a shadow of the mystery of God. And this is true in our capacity for hope and creation and so on and so forth. So, um, this turn of the subject and this focus of Rahner is typical of contemporary theology. Um, and uh, I think, again, we need to see that it's, it didn't just fall out of the air, but that it's grounded scripturally. Um, it's grounded, I think I went too far there. And it's grounded scripturally. <coughs> And it's grounded in, in, in uh, the earliest uh, doctrine in terms of the development of, of uh, the church fathers in the first centuries. So what we've been taught, Rohr says, is that Jesus is only God and that we are merely human. I don't know if that's what you learned. That's what I learned. Um, and... Uh, he says, no, Jesus is not God. Jesus is the union of the human and the divine. Precisely what we are called to be. So, Jesus isn't another kind of being. But Jesus is the kind of human being who opened himself radically to God and to God's self-gift and who became transparent to God. I don't think there's any doubt that Jesus' self-consciousness was that he was the Son of God. I also don't think that there's any doubt that he thought he was the only Son of God. You know? And his call to others to follow him, he didn't teach it. When you pray, pray like this, my Father. He said, our Father. We are the children of God. So the titles of Jesus, which are radical, particularly in late Palestinian Judaism, uh, very, very radical, and that created lots of conflicted uh, interaction between Jews and Gentiles, um, and between Christians and, and, and Jews in, in the first century. But these titles, uh, are uh, important because uh, they reflect uh, a reality, which has always been interpreted as an ontology that was somehow uh, explained uh, uh, in that way, but never in terms of human experience. Did Jesus have a mystical consciousness that led him to this union with God? And is, is Jesus' oneness with God, the oneness of humanity and divinity in Jesus. Well, this is, this is the thinking of uh, at least a few people. Uh, Marcus Borg, who I think is a very important New Testament scholar today, would certainly argue this. <clears throat> um, Borg says, for Jesus... God was not simply an article of belief, but an experienced reality. Um, and uh, Borg talks about how the mysticism uh, that Jesus, if he were in fact a Jewish mystic, received was something that had occupied uh, Jews in, in, in the, the Hebrew faith for centuries, at least since the deportation to Babylon. Uh, and I would argue about the prophets uh, earlier than that. But at any rate, and, and then it became a particularly popular in post-exilic uh, Judaism after the exile, those centuries immediately leading up to Jesus' time. 
Um, then he talks about the, the reports in the Gospels, Jesus seeking contemplative prayer, his visions, and so forth. Uh, all of these um, ways of understanding Jesus' uh, union with God. Along with morning and evening prayer, synagogue prayers, prayers of thanksgiving, praise and petition, contemplative form of prayer was part of the Jewish tradition um, and very likely a, a, an incredibly important uh, aspect of Jesus' own uh, life. Okay, well, uh, I'm going to skip that. I'm going to talk just very briefly about Paul who he calls a Jewish Christ mystic. Um, and I think if you follow the story, well, I wrote an essay recently called Reconstructing Paul and His Message because I think Paul has been radically misunderstood over the centuries. But, but Paul, I think, and he never left his, his, his fundamental Judaism. It's not as though the, the experience on the road to Damascus said, well, I'm done being a Jew. Now I'm going to be a Christian. No. He became a particular kind of Jew who saw uh, uh, the, the God of Israel had done something spectacular in raising Jesus from the dead and that this became the center of his, of his mystical theology. Um, okay, well, let's go to earliest Christian theology. Um, incarnational theology, the triune God. The first point Borg makes about what's going on in these first centuries is that all speculation about the mystery of God is grounded in the human experience of God. Before incarnation and Trinity were doctrine, they were the mystical experience of believing Christians. So, it was the mystical experience of Christians that compelled them to do the theology that led to the doctrine, not the other way around. <coughs> We've decided that God is three-way now, so you guys have to learn that. No, our experience. And the experience is fundamentally this relational uh, uh, intimacy that is at the core of uh, um, the, the Greek father's understanding. Um, yeah, it seems obvious that many have the unexam unexamined assumption that somehow Christian doctrine fell out of the sky. <laughs> it was the experience of the first Christians that compelled the reflections. Without a grounding and mystical experience, these early doctrinal formulations appear to moderns as fanciful academic nonsense. What are they talking about? But they're groping to articulate what their experience is. And the key insight is the union of God and man in Jesus and our union with God in Christ and the Spirit. It's all about intimate communion with the divine. So one of the things that he talks about is the Cappadocian Fathers. Uh, Basil the Great, Gregory of Nyssa, and Gregory of Nazianzus. And he picks up this particular wonderful Greek term, perichoresis. Perichoresis. And he says that, that Gregory used this to describe the relationship between the divine and human natures in Christ. And then uh, uh, extended it to the understanding of the three persons uh, in the Trinity. They enter into each other, permeate each other, and dwell in each other. One in being, they are also one in intimacy of their friendship. So it's a relational term that talks really about interpenetration, and that kind of intimate interconnection. Um, the relationship of the triune God is intensified by this perichoresis, this indwelling expresses and realizes fellowship between the Father and the Son as an intimacy. And then they use this wonderful term, the Holy Spirit is the kiss of God. 
Together they breathe forth the Holy Spirit as the kiss of God, the Holy Spirit proceeding from the love of the Father and the Son through an act of their unified will. If as properly understood, the Father is he who kisses, the, the Son is he who is kissed, then it cannot be wrong to see the kiss the Holy Spirit, for he is the in, 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 imperturbable peace of the Father and the Son, their unshakable bond, their undivided love, and their indivisible unity. We're talking about bonding. The bonding that goes on among human beings in, in love and friendship and marriage and family, um, the deep bonding uh, that goes on in human beings and that extends clearly to our pets. Uh, those, of, those of you who are pet lovers know what I'm talking about. You know uh, uh, the experience of bonding that is, goes beyond uh, 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 single species. My wife says you can't really be a mystic if you're only a single species lover. <laughs> so, uh, so, the triune God is an outflowing, is another image he uses. God imaged as water wheel. God is an outflowing relationship. It's almost better to think of God as a verb than as a very hard noun, a continuous fountain, a process of love poured out, received, and poured out again. What is outpoured is perfectly received, emptiness filled, and this, he says, is the kenosis mirrored in the cross, emptied and filled and poured out. That kind of relational, uh, uh, processive <coughs> movement is a good way to think about uh, these early doctrines as, as they emerge in the first centuries of Christianity. And so Rohr moves to uh, the love hormone, oxytocin. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were talking very briefly about this prior to the talk this evening, but the whole idea that this powerful hormone within human beings and another animal life is, is a bonding mechanism, a neurofeedback uh, <coughs> bonding mechanism that is uh, incredibly powerful and effective in, in all kinds of bonding, including the bonding that goes on in childbirth and, and in uh, breastfeeding, uh, the, the bonding that goes on between lovers um, in, in sexual intercourse, um, all through the, the, the reproductive process. Uh, I'm reading mine and I'm not showing you what I'm reading. So, um, so these are, this is the, the positive feedback mechanisms of oxytocin. Uh, well, Rohr says, this is, this is the relational knowing that we're talking about in the Church Fathers. We find scientific ground for the unity of divine and human in Jesus and the relationality that is in Trinity. It's also our experience of communion with God, the uncreated grace of the Holy Spirit. This relational knowing of God is immediate, unbrokered, and intuitive. And it's open to all of us. It's immediate, it's unbrokered, and it's intuitive. It's like the relationality between lovers, between mother and a child. And then Rural makes this comment, which I love. He says, only God can know God, and God in us knows God beyond us. That's the noose. The knowledge as recognition. Our soul, God in our soul, recognizes God beyond our soul. Uh, and that is recognition. Uh, so it's knowledge as participation. Well, 
this is where we went wrong. <laughs> and again, I grew up in St. Augustine's Parish and went to St. Augustine's School, so I can talk this way. <laughs> but I think, I think if, if you've studied or read Augustine, you know you have to recognize him as himself a mystic. Um, but I think in his oppositional thinking, uh, in his debates with Pelagius and the Donatists in North Africa, uh, he's driven uh, to uh, very hardened positions that are non-mystical. He loses his, his mystical basis for his theology. Um, his theology begins with the fall in which humanity is imaged as a masa damnata, having inherited original sin, totally incapable of love or doing good. This is where our whole theology, you've got to get that baby baptized. Or if you're not part of this, you're damned. If you haven't taken the antidote, you know, you're, you're living with the toxin. And so the Holy Spirit becomes in Augustine's theology, and I don't want to single him out because the whole kind of Latin fathers went in this direction. He was just the most brilliant. Um, they go to this idea of created grace, a kind of metaphysical substance that heals the wounded will and makes salvation possible for some but not others. Created grace is God's free and unconditional gift, but it is given in and through the church and its sacraments. And there's the quote from Jack Shea. Well, it's a great irony, I think, um, that Augustine, because if you read his confessions, it's a brilliant uh, autobiographical essay in mysticism. But after Augustine, Christianity becomes increasingly focused on a mandatory ecclesia, obsessed with human guilt, sinfulness, and doctrinal error, ready to engage in violence to protect truth, understanding the life of faith as less mystical experience and more as mechanical sacramental participation and obedience to ecclesial authority. This is what happens in the centuries after Augustine, as this Latin paradigm becomes developed. Uh, and it's, this, is, this is a major factor in how we lost our way. So, Rohr doesn't spend a lot of time with Augustine, but he spends a lot of time with Francis, obviously his mentor, and with the Franciscan theologians. Um, and here we see a reversal of Augustine. Over against the focus on the fall and the ruination of creation, a new focus on the goodness of creation. His wonderful uh, hymn to creation. Father, Son, Sister, Moon, and so on and so forth. Uh, creation itself is expressive of divine grace. And here he says that the incarnation is not an antidote to sin, but rather it's the intention of God from all time. So if you can think of reality as complex and as vast and as unpredictable and mysterious as it is in, in, in anthropomorphic forms, which is what our tradition has done in, in calling reality God, uh, says that the intention of this from all time was ultimately the union, the oxytocin-ridden bonding of the human and the divine that takes place in Jesus Christ. That's, that's not a second thought. That was the first thought. That was the first thought. And it's the thought that's buried in our souls and that we're called to. So the emphasis shifts from radical sin to radical grace. 
Um, well, there's Francis of Assisi, uh, influenced a lot by Hildegard of Bingham, a Celtic tradition, uh, which was very big on, on this kind of mysticism, powerful spirits associated with the forces of nature. The whole of creation is the numinous, a mystical unity. Yeah, and again, once the roads are repaired and the government is open, this is all assuming that Moses is able to lead us out of Egypt. <laughs> uh, go up to Rocky Mountain National Park again and see this, this, this luminous numinous uh, that is all around us in the park. Scotus goes further. He says that there is creation only because of the incarnation. That Christ is the beginning, the middle, and the end of creation. In the incarnation, the universe has realized its creative, its creational potential. And that Christ stands as the center of the universe, as the reason for its existence. The universe is for Christ, not Christ for the universe. And then he says simply that Humanity hasn't realized our potential. <clears throat> if God, if man had not sinned, Christ still would have come. Okay, so radical grace today, and then we'll wind this up. Well, many have been wounded by the focus on pervasive sin, shame-based morality, an image of God. Who will torture people for eternity? I wrote an article a few years ago called The Generation After Hell, <laughs> which talks about young adult spirituality today. But the thing is, isn't it interesting that most of us were socialized into a church that imaged God as, as, uh, as ready to torture people for eternity? The worst human being you've ever met would never do that. We get tired after a week or two. <laughs> but imagine, this is how we image God as ready to do this. And this is the threat that we still hear from some of the evangelicals. Do you know where you're going to go when you die? Oh, I expect I'll be tortured for eternity. <laughs> That's the God I believe in. <laughs> well, no wonder you can't believe in God. Um, so, we've suffered the consequences of created grace um, and felt the need to be recognized as demonstrating our justification, if not by faith, then by self-righteousness. Um, but again, the point here is that Jesus and Paul were universalists. All are invited to open themselves to the self-giving divine love that seeks intimacy with souls in an alternative community of equals who are committed to justice and to reconciling peace. That's the emergent church. Radical grace proclaims God's radical mercy and God's radical compassion, which is universal, though honestly mediated through human relationships, through socio-political structures that serve equity and justice, through our contact with the natural world. Radical Greek grace seeks to overcome the dualities and the polarization and emerge from excessive individualism and the false notion, the false notion of personal autonomy. <coughs> so here we have the great pattern of dual consciousness. And by the way, nothing fuels this fire like football. <laughs> <laughs>
football and war, you know? Us against them. Friend and enemy, black and white, right and wrong, good, bad, win, lose, Christian, pagan, sacred, profane, male, female, masculine, feminine, gay, straight, true, false, individual, collective, nature and grace, human, divine, right, left. These dualisms, um, Rohr says, we can't, we can't bear them. You can't hold these uh, either orbs. There's only one reality, and all of these are held together in a tense of union. All of these are held together in a tense of union. <laughs> so, so the important thing is to recognize, uh, you know, that this complementarity and this paradoxical nature of reality, it's okay. Winning isn't the only thing. I always knew that that Green Bay coach was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, and yet, as we'll discuss on Monday night, most of us grow up learning that and doing that. It is the only thing. And by God, we're going to win. We're going to achieve. We're going to accomplish. And it's not bad. It's just that the other side of life introduces us to a much more sane uh, and mellow shalom that recognizes. And you can see it. When you get to be our age, you can see it. <laughs> Things that you were just totally totally uh, shook up about, now you can smile at them or you can see other people and you recognize, well, I, I, I get both of them. I get both of them. You know? But we can't deliver ourselves from this, from these prisons, and I think we need to think, see them as prisons. Uh, but we can let go. We can surrender. We can trust. We can experience conversion. And all of these are experienced by grace. And Rohr would say, it's not our work. It's God's work. And God is, is doing it in our encounter with life. And we will just let it happen. <laughs> if we stop fighting it. So what is the goal? The goal is intimacy with God, union with God, retrieving the true self imaged in Christ, the path, mysticism, contemplation, paradox, non-dual consciousness, oxymoron, both and. Sin is alienation, separation, grounded in either or consciousness, clear and distinct logical thinking. Ego assertion over against sin is living out of our false self. So that's my presentation tonight. If you look at Christianity as essentially a mysticism, from Moses and the prophets to Jesus and Paul, the ecstatic Eucharistic communities of the Pauline mission, the Greek Fathers to the Rhineland mystics and the Celts. Luther's justified sinners. If that isn't an oxymoron, and yet it's right on target. To humanity's divinization, something that is emphasized in Orthodox Christianity. From the covenant at Mount Sinai to the contemporary urge for ecumenism and interfaith understanding, let us open ourselves to the presence of God and be that presence in a world, a universal shalom. So thank you for listening. <laughs> Please uh, uh, feel free to uh, raise questions, but you can also offer your own perspective. Uh, 
uh, I just happen to have the microphone. <laughs> but I'm happy to share it. And if you have comments or thoughts, please add them. I didn't quite get what you were saying about all the sacrament or the sacraments. Um, are they not important or are they? No, I said that we had. Um, that we had reduced our experience of God to that that is mediated through the sacraments. So it's the reductionism that goes with that that is the problem. Our encounter with God is everywhere in life. The sacraments are the place where we go to name and celebrate that which is going on everywhere. I think they're very important properly understood. But... Uh, if, if we think that the rest of the world is, uh, the rest of our life is all secular, so I need to quick get to church on Sunday to have an experience with God, I think we're missing the point. Our encounter with God is, is, is through all of life, and the ritual life of Christianity properly understood is where we name and celebrate that in the language that is given to us in the Bible. <coughs> Does that help? Yeah. Other? So when, when we're looking at that list of gay, straight, black, white, uh, you know, put on the list, how do we talk to our 10 and 11 year olds about how to not go to school, play soccer, go to dance class, and want to win? <laughs> well, if you, if, you, if you try to talk to your kids about that way, you know for sure that they'll do just the opposite. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think, you know, I think one of my uh, mistakes as a parent was not not talking to them about that, not being there. <laughs> not being that enough for them. Um, but, you know, there's a time and a place for everything, and the 15-year-old is not the 45-year-old. If you're acting like a 15-year-old when you're 45 or 50, you've got some, you've got some spiritual work to do. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, you yeah, Ego formation and achievement. You know, the, Roar says the first half of life we're we're building this container. You know, and uh, it's important. Uh, the false self is not a bad self. It's just not the true self. We'll talk about this a lot on Monday night, which you don't want to miss, by the way. <laughs> You'll find out who really did it. <laughs> so, Dr. Ludwig, do you think it was possible for the church not to have taken that direction? Do I think it was possible? Yeah. And what would that, how would they have not taken that? How would that have happened? Well, you know, it's like, did, did the people of Israel have to set up Egypt in the promised land. No, but they did. And the prophets had to excoriate them because of it. And they ultimately had to lose the land in their own understanding of the tradition because of it. So, you know, you know what would it, if we had been faithful to, to our biblical tradition, particularly if we had been faithful to Jesus, and, and to the New Testament, uh, we wouldn't have gone where we went, but we did, you know. Talk about an oxymoron, you know, the, the place where the Pope is supposed to live, this one doesn't live there, is called the Apostolic Palace. Now that's an oxymoron. But that whole... So, you know, and yeah, 
the only thing we can say is um, there's a lot of Augustine in all of this. And it's not just Augustine. The whole movement of the church to go down the wrong path. Uh, we Were we the ones that were in charge? <coughs> would have probably gone down that path ourselves, you know? So we have to have, you know, some understanding and appreciation. Uh, but we need to recognize error, I think, and that's not where we need to be today. Not to just keep, keep that going, but to try and retrieve something much more deep and profound uh, and, and important, particularly for our time. I'd like to ask uh, Richard Rohr a question, and I hope you can answer for him. <laughs> um, people have um, hallucinations, uh, which I think could be uh, defined as a false perception. Uh, there are psychotic experiences where one hears voices, and uh, people have near-death experiences where they report wonderful things. So my question to Richard Rohr is, how do you know that a mystical experience is real, valid, and genuine, and true, as opposed to something that's uh, a private event that's contained within the chemistry of the brain inside your own skull? Thank you for asking that question. I'm definitely going to send it to Richard. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, it's a great question, and I think uh, Roar would, Roar, that's why scripture and tradition are checks on our experience. Our experience is not our only authority. It's a very important authority, but it's not the only authority. And so it's very important to kind of check it out. And uh, if we're hallucinating, uh, if this is a product of, of the ego, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, you know, find, find that out pretty quickly. Um, so again, I mean, and, and also I would say, you know, to go back to Paul, St. Paul who said, you know, you have to see what is the fruit of this. Is this is this the fact that now you think that you're somehow truly special? I have a great story. A guy who walked into the cafeteria in the uh, South Cafeteria at Notre Dame. I don't know if you've ever been there, but this huge mammoth cafeteria where there's every kind of food you can imagine being offered to students there. And, and he paused for a moment and he thought, you know, to all these people, he said, I'm no better and no worse than any of these people. All of these people are loved by God and I'm no better than any of them. Then he paused for a moment and he said, you know, but knowing that makes me just a little bit better. <laughs> so, um, so, I mean, the fruit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love. And if this leads to, to loving activity in the person's life, you know, that's one, one test for it. But again, the other thing is to check it out and, and, and to see if, you know, this is just my hallucination or if this is something that... Uh, it, it, this would be a good question to ask Dr. Vians on the 27th. <laughs> <laughs> because the integral spirituality... <laughs> Uh, is talking about the same kind of thing, right? So, so uh, I don't know, does anybody want to add to that? Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a very good question. Are you going to speak to this or something? Oh, okay, good. Um, 
My recollection is that, I mean, many years ago, read actually William James when he quoted, he actually said something very much along the lines of what you said, and that is, what is the effect of a purported hallucination or mystical experience on your life? Does it elevate you? Does it make you more loving? Mm -hmm. Does it make you happier? Or does it do like we recently saw in Washington, uh, hearing voices that they're telling you to kill and to maim and, and really acting out of hatred and fear and so on. It, they're very, very different in terms of the way they operate in your experience and what it does to your subsequent life. You know? I think, to me, that's a very important guiding principle. Thank you. You're going to speak to this too? Yeah, I think the challenge is to check it out with whom. Uh, I frequently talk with women who tell me stories of consulting their priest about birth control, uh, mothers with eight children saying, can I practice birth control? And this poor guy just out of the seminary who doesn't really know where all the pieces are is determined to tell them, no, they can't practice birth control. So who you check it out with is very important. And I think that's part of tradition. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Not everybody is a trusted counselor. Other thoughts on the same topic before we go to something else? Okay. Uh, having experienced both, I think this is much, much more complicated mm -hmm. than we're making it right now. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things that I had that I thought were hallucinations have bits and pieces of mysticism in them. But boy, I can tell you that my truly mystical experiences are totally different. And they're peaceful, and they're lots of times connected to nature. And you know, you know you've been in the presence of God at that moment in time. And it doesn't have anything to do with ego. It doesn't have anything to do with it's a it's a feeling. But I think it's very complicated. It's not simple. I, I think I do think the kind of what you're talking about is much more common than people think. When I say to people, Well, have you had a mystical experience? I say, Well, no, I've never had any. Well, have you ever looked up at the stars in the sky at night and just really looked at them, just been present with them? You know? Have you ever looked into the face of your beloved and just wondered in awe? You know, have you ever had a baby? <laughs> have you ever had a baby? I mean, that's, that's, that's what's wonderful about Reiner's teaching. Is it's an everyday mysticism. This stuff is much more common than we think. And it isn't like, oh, I'm hearing voices and all of these things. It's a, it's a deeper, more profound uh, sense of presence and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and a loving, abiding presence. Oh. I'm going to stick my foot in it big time because I too have had the near-death out-of-body experience. Actually turned blue and cold and he had been told I darn near died. I think it's a matter of your imagination or your ego. It doesn't have a profound, peaceful, humbling experience on you. Uh, I think suffering is very scary, but when your soul leaves <coughs> your body, it isn't. And I can still remember uh, the last ego, uh, pull it away a little bit, I can't hear me. <laughs> uh, the last um, thought I had that was of my ego was turning my head to watch the nurse run out of the room and she banged through the, through the uh, doors to get the doctor. And my last in-body thought was, you're too late, Cookie, I'm gone. <laughs> But it did have a very profound uh, effect on my life, and I don't care to talk about it very much. But sometimes I do, particularly to people who are dying and want to hear about it. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, let's move on to some other questions. So, excellent question. Actually, I will bring it up with Richard and see how he responds to that. Uh, other thoughts or comments tonight? Questions? Yes. So how do you uh, talk to, because you teach at a college, and, and do the young students, do they uh, uh, get this? Yeah, I think they do. I think, I think there's a kind of nature of this system that operates sort of among a lot of young people today automatically. If, 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 you, if you probe young adult spirituality, which many of them will quickly distinguish very carefully from religion. I'm not religious, but I am spiritual. And when they tell you about spirit, well, what is spirituality about? And, you know, it's very common for religious folks like ourselves to kind of smirk at what they say. But, but we shouldn't, because they're reporting real experience. And, uh, it's, it's, it's very important, it's very good, it's, it's terrific. Um, so, uh, so they get, they get this. I think, you know, we badly need, and this is why, you know, and this is probably why we became churchianity. We need a church that, that prospers all of this, that celebrates all of this, that teaches all of this that facilitates all of this. And it's hard to live in our world without a viable institution that's really doing that. And most of them have never known, you know, a very viable uh, church experience. I had one student who I taught a course called Introduction to Catholicism. And at the end of the class, I was asking them what the experience of the course was like. He said, Oh, Dr. Levy, he said, this was, I loved your class. This was just terrific. I, I just love the way you explain everything. It, it doesn't have anything to do with any church I've ever belonged to. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just terrific. <laughs> well, you know, it's, you know, we, sociologists uh, talk about how we need a uh, a structure that affirms our deep and profound meanings and values, or we won't hold on to them. That's what, that's what I think the church is uh, at its best. And so, you know, I, I spent most of my life educating lay people for ministry, asking them, and, and that's what I do in Chicago still, Loyola. I don't teach mostly undergraduates, I teach mostly graduate students who are engaged in work like Jim Reed and Joachim and people who, who are doing campus ministry, uh, uh, chaplaincy ministry, working uh, in schools, parishes, working in uh, faith-sponsored social justice and community uh, action groups and things like that. So. Um, so yeah, I think I think young people get this, and uh, I think they're, they're not they're not naive enough to think that they can find all of this in an ecclesial structure, but they're they're trying to find it and create structures that, that can prosper this wherever they can. You know, that's important. Do we have a time limit, Jim? Are we done? Close. If we're done about nine, whatever. We're close to that. Why, why don't we take one more question? One more question or one more comment? There are none. <laughs> <laughs>